what would you what advice would you give yourself or what would you have done different because I feel like there's a lot of young players that's going through that same yeah. thing um yeah I would say just be yourself um you know obviously I was a first round pick and I, I came out of college as a scoring guard scoring guy who can get to the basket create shots being aggressive putting pressure on defense and then I got to the league and I was like oh, I need to be a true point guard I need to you know get my teammates involved think everybody everybody else first but you know, at the end of the day, I got drafted for a reason. I got drafted to do what I did. And I think I kind of lost sight of that. All right, welcome back to the Role Player Podcast, presented by Swiss Cultures, featured on Eurohoops.net, YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. We back against the one and only Stanford gentleman, co-founder of Swiss Cultures. I'm going to start calling you the CEO, though, because I want to feel like I'm talking to the boss, man. I'm, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm, I'm just say CEO. Fuck with you know what I'm saying? But uh, So we back one more time. 11-year overseas vet, Anthony Goods. What's up with you? Man, man, I'm uh, I'm chilling, man. I'm over here in Europe, man. I ain't been able to cut my hair in like the last week, bro. Like I, I had to, I had to, I had to cut my own joint, man. I felt like I was back hooping again, man. <laughs> man, I, I knew, I knew you was over there, and I got back to the states. I went and got my little taper. I look like I'm Benjamin Button over here. I'm making a comeback. You look down, you know what I'm saying? I'm looking all right, man. I'm looking real good, man. So <laughs> I've been waiting for this. I wanted to do the episode like a couple of days ago when it was real fresh. So. I I, got my, hey, I had, hey, I had hey, my brush. I had my brush on hand. You know what I'm saying? Hey, but time That's out, man. Cake. I gotta, I gotta give a shout out to my barber out in Miami, man. I, uh, you know, recently I turned my IG to like pretty much just like a sports page, but uh, somebody slid in my DMs last night. You know what I mean? So you know, I think my profile pic must be hidden, or or maybe the podcast videos, you know, with the crispy edge up. So I got a shout out to my barber, man. I'm gonna he tell, I'm gonna tell right. you where the found the youth is. Guess who cut my hair? It's a Ooh. white lady with ass. <laughs> she got a she, she got a black stepdaddy and she fired with it. <laughs> she, she, she all right with it, man. But listen, we gotta get to this guest, man. We got a, a very, 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 very special guest. You know, we got first round pick in 2013, 18th overall to the Atlanta Hawks and then to the Dallas Mavericks. Uh all Euroleague first team in 2022, all Euroleague second team in 2021. One of a few people, I don't know exactly how I'm 50, 40, 90 in EuroLeague. EuroLeague finals top score. I can't keep going on and on because we're going to be here all day if we do. We got the one and only Shane Larkin with the good hair over there, man. What's up with you? <laughs> What's good, dog? <laughs> man, we appreciate you joining us, man. We definitely appreciate you joining us. But look, man, we're going to jump right into it. Look, you've been in Ephesus for, what, it's been four? Four years now? Yeah. Four years yeah. in Ephesus. So the first question is, y'all go back-to-back EuroLeague champions. When you left Boston and came to Ephesus, is this what you had in mind? Um, I mean, to be honest, no. Nah, I didn't I didn't know exactly what uh, we were going to be able to turn into. I know um, when I finished that season in Boston, uh, I wanted to go back to Boston. Um, I separated my shoulder at the end of that season, but um, – you know, I was thinking that there was a chance, an opportunity for me to go back there, but obviously it didn't work out. Uh, and then there were some other opportunities around the league, but, you know, nothing that was, you know, minutes guaranteed. So um, then I started talking to teams overseas. I had already been overseas one time. And then Ephes talked to me about, um, you know, the guys they were bringing in, what they thought they had. And, um, you know, I saw an opportunity. I uh, didn't know there was nine new players the first season. None of us had been here before, so nine new foreigners. And, um you know, I saw talent because I played against a lot of these guys and, you know, just wanted to see what we could turn it into. I never, you know, at that moment would have, you know, thought we would be sitting here back to back champs. But um, I thought we had a chance to be pretty good. So it obviously turned out uh, pretty perfect. Yeah, I'll be thinking like, man, I mean, even just looking around EuroLeague, it seems like the teams that are able to like kind of keep that core together yeah. usually tend to have a, the most success like year to year and even – the fact that y'all went back to back and the last team that went back to back was Olympiacos and you yeah. know they had they made six roster changes in between their two seasons th their two championships and y'all yeah. only made three you know yeah. what I mean like how how important do you think or what advantages do you think y'all had just keeping that core together um I mean y'all know your uh experience is everything over here uh you know you have a lot of teams that are young talented teams but when it comes down to winning 
you know, those big games or those little moments or, like, taking fouls in transition, just, like, small things that you got to do uh, to keep teams at bay. Uh, I think the experience that we've been able to have and, and hold over over the last four years has definitely allowed us uh, to get to this moment. Um, obviously, we took a while in the first year to kind of find that, that chemistry, um, but towards the second half of that first season, we started, you know, trending in the right direction. Obviously, lost in the championship the first year, came back the second year, was in first place by – by a lot, uh, we were cracking everybody, and then COVID happened. So I think being able to keep that group together, nobody making jumps to different teams, trying to take money or going to the league or stuff like that, uh, allowed us to be able to come back for these last two years and you know kind of solidify everything that we had been working from uh, for for the jump. Is that is that something y'all talked about, like as a group, not making that jump to the league? Me like we could do something special, or did that just kind of happen organically. Uh, in a sense, um, you know, I had a couple opportunities. Boss has had some opportunities, but um, we felt like we had a, an opportunity to be, do something special here. Um, and even guys on the team have had opportunities to go to different teams, maybe for more money or a bigger role or, and stuff like that. But, you know, we felt like after losing in the championship that first year, if we were able to stick together and kind of grow and kind of use that that momentum to t to carry us back to the championship and know what it took the second time we got there to win, um, I think that's definitely helped us, you know, get to the point where we are now. And, you know, it takes a lot of sacrifice from guys and, you know, guys who probably have more ability than what's shown um, based on the role that they have here. You know, it's, it's everybody buying in and, and buying into the system that has allowed us to, you know, kind of become this family and, you know, it's carried us to, to where we are now. That Basconia experience, how big – oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, nah, you got it, you got it, yeah, go back to Basconia. That Basconia experience, you talked about experience. How uh, how important was the experience there for you to, you know, go back to Boston and then do what you're doing now in Ephesus? Um, I think Basconia was, was huge for me at the time. Um, you know, my first three years as a pro were very unstable years. Um, you know, I got drafted, like you said, 2013. A week after the draft, I broke my ankle. Um, so I missed half my rookie season. I didn't get to play in summer league preseason, none of that. And we were on a, I was on a win now team with like Dirk, Sean Marion, Jose Calderon, Monte Ellis, Vince Carter. So they were in like win now mode. So not being able to do summer league, not being able to do preseason and then kind of just be thrown into the fire as a, as a first round pick after missing, you know, five months into an NBA game. You know, I re never was really able to find my feet. Um, and then that summer I was in Dallas all summer, got traded to the Knicks. And then, you know, super excited going to play in the garden, you know, feeling like you're about to, you know, do something. And then, you know, they make the trades or make the changes that they made in management, brought in Phil Jackson, try to implement the triangle, which if you know anything about the triangle, who I am as a player, it <laughs> might be the worst system for me to try to play in. <laughs> uh, so that actually didn't work at all. Uh, I wish it would have. I love playing up there, but obviously it didn't work. And then uh, that season was what it was. They didn't pick up my team option. Signed as a free agent in Brooklyn. Started in Brooklyn. This was after, you know, they wanted to win that championship within five years with the new owner. So that year they brought in a new coach, Lana Hollins. We had 10 new guys on the roster. And then after 20 games, coach got fired. After 25 games, GM got fired. So we were out there for 57 games playing pickup. And just, you know, whoever caught it was trying to go one-on-one. -on -one. And that's just, that's what it, it just is what it was. So everybody was just trying to go for their next contract that year. And I'm a, I'm a team guy. I've always been a team guy, team player. And I was young at the time, so I didn't really understand. Like, I didn't have the mentality that you need to, you know, be that go get it and don't worry about nobody else kind of mindset that you need to be in that situation. Um, so... You know, over those first three years, my, my love for basketball had kind of been just kept getting stabbed in all different directions. And it just started hurting. Like, you know, I didn't really understand what I needed to do because I felt like I was playing well enough, but just wasn't getting the opportunities that I thought I wanted or deserved. Uh, so, you know, the love for basketball had kind of faded away at that moment. Not completely, but just that genuine passion that you had had taken a lot of jabs. And then going to Basconia, um, small city, very, very small city, um, not much to do in the city, but basketball. So when I got there, it was all basketball, basketball, basketball. And, you know, in Europe, a lot of coaches like to have two practices a day. And in, in some certain cities, you know, you complain about that. But in Basconia, I was I wanted two practices a day because there was absolutely nothing else to do. So I think going there kind of rejuvenated me and made me fall back in love with basketball and find my passion again. And, and I think that's why, you know, 
that year was so important for me and my growth as a player, as a man, and in a lot of different areas. Yo, if you could go back, let's say, and give yourself advice back in uh, in your NBA years when you were, you know, you're going through those struggles, like what what would you what advice would you give yourself, and what would you have done different? Because I feel like there's a lot of young players that's going through that same yeah. thing. Um, yeah, I would say just be yourself. Um, you know, obviously I was a first round pick. And I, I came out of college as a scoring guard, scoring guy who can get to the basket, create shots, being aggressive, putting pressure on defense. And then I got to the league and I was like, oh, I need to be a true point guard. I need to, you know, get my teammates involved, think of everybody, everybody else first. But, you know, at the end of the day, I got drafted for a reason. I got drafted to do what I did. And I think I kind of lost sight of that. And I figured that, you know, in the league now, you know, I'm playing with Dirk Nowinski and these guys, I'm playing with Melo, I'm playing with these guys. I'm like, all right, well, you know, I need to make sure they get the ball. I need to make sure they get shots. I need to make sure they happy because if they not happy, then I ain't no way they're going to want me on the court. And in rea- reality, you know, I need I, I got drafted to help them. So I got drafted to be myself and help them be in a pos- better position as opposed to, you know, me looking out for them first. And I think my mindset would have been different now if I could go back and tell myself, just be you, be aggressive, make the mistakes. And uh, if you – Go out there, be aggressive, play with no regrets, and then, you know, whatever happens, happens, then I'll be able to live with that better. But that mindset I had at that time was more so, you know, take care of everybody else, make sure they straight, make sure they getting their shots, and, you know, you take the back seat as opposed to just going out there and being who I, who I truly was. Man, what about what about the what advice would you give to people that don't need to be themselves? Because not everybody needs to be themselves. <laughs> so, 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 True. So, some cats got to change, man. Some cats got to be that. different. <laughs> True that. Um, yeah, that's a that's a tough one because not being yourself is difficult, dog. But I think once you, I think the biggest thing is just to find your, find your your lane, find what works for you, find what works for people, and what they they think you're good at, and um, just kind of stay in that lane. You know, a lot of guys nowadays are making so much money being three and D guys, just playing defense, not dribbling, not trying to pass the ball, not doing all that extra stuff, just locking up and then run to that corner and shooting that three when they sign him. $80 million contracts now. So I just think, you know, just grind, work, and just try to find that opportunity. Basketball is all about opportunity at the end of the day. So just trying to find that perfect opportunity where you're appreciated and what you do best. And um, once you figure what that, that what that is, you know, just trying to run with that as far as you can. How uh, – yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely real. You need to – I only ask that because it's like – there's a big movement of people like be yourself, be yourself. And it's like, for real, some people, you got, you got to grow up. Everybody got to grow up. Right. Like you said, you know what I'm saying? Like, even when you was coming out and you know, you probably had a different idea of what the game would look like. So I guess one of the most challenging parts for most athletes, especially basketball players going in between overseas and NBA is like finding your role. Cause everybody thinks they're alpha. Right. And we had Elijah right. on last week, and he talked about that. Right. So finding your role amongst other alphas might be the hardest thing to do in sports. For yeah, that's facts. That's so. facts. Because, like, I think, I don't know if I saw Elijah say it, but most people in high school, college, you're the best guy on your team. Right. And you're going to be the best guy on your team. So, like, that's what you know. That's what you feel like you, you're always going to be. But then reality set in, and you're like, <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> oh I'm, I'm with this guy now. So you can't, you can't, you can't always have that alpha mentality, but it's tough because it's a very, very fine line of like not losing line. yourself, being who you truly are, but like understanding like, all right, I am me. I used to shoot these wild step back threes, <laughs> turn the ball over four or five times a game, stay in the game for 35 minutes. Now, you know, it's, it's you there, but then there's a lot of guys over there that, that can do that as well. So if you know, that just ain't been working out for you, then you probably need to look at some tape and understand that I right, this might not be exactly what I'm I'm here to do and then kind of readjust yourself, look in the mirror and say, All right, yeah. let me kind of recalibrate <laughs> and try to get back right. to what, what's gonna work for the team. Man, it's not yeah, that, that you ain't gonna you ain't gonna I mean, I think the the main thing <laughs> in any situation in hoop, man, is just finding a way to get on the court. You right. know what I mean? And that's why, right. like, I'm sure we all been on teams where cats just keep bumping heads with the coach. And then it's just like, right. bruh, like, as stubborn as he is, right. everything he could be saying could be BS. Like, sometimes you just got to, you know, bite the bullet so you can stay on the court and then figure things out from there. But, you know, sure. I think a lot of cats, especially coming overseas where there's a cultural difference in mentalities and stuff like that, right. 
they they have a problem tucking their ego, you know what I mean, yeah. and all this, and it ends up hurting them. Because I feel like now that's facts as well. Over here, like you said, culturally, it, it, it's a big thing. Egos and pride are play much more into just physical ability over here than than it does over there. So for sure. It's, I would say, especially someone in your situation, but you know, most guys when you come overseas, like everybody want to be in the NBA. So you already biting the bullet, tucking your ego, just coming overseas right. in, in our mind, right? So it's like you get right. here and it's like finding that role. Everybody can sit here and I guess letting go of the idea of being like, oh, well, I could do that if y'all let me and build a team around me. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. you know what right. I'm saying? Like, shit, right. let me be that guy. Instead of just letting right. it, so it, it is a fine line. It's hard to do. So, I mean, was that was that a challenge for you when you left? Uh, when you came over here the first time to Basconia? Um, not necessarily because I spoke to the coach before before I came over, because uh, I was very indifferent about it. You know, I wanted the opportunity to play and be that guy I was in college, because um, I felt like I hadn't done that in my three years in the league, but. You know, also, because, you know, they also say, if you once you leave, it's hard to get back. They, once you leave, the league, it's hard to get back. And <laughs> it's true. Uh, so I wanted to, to make sure that the situation that I was going to uh, was going to be able to fit my style. And he made me feel real comfortable before I signed. He, he told me that he saw he watched me in college. He wanted me to be that guy. So that's a tough situation to find in general and who and anywhere. But for him to be able to tell me that very before I even, you know, got on that plane, um, that was big for me. So when I got there, you know, I had already had it in my mind that I was just going to go play, just go beat me, make the mistakes, shoot the shots, be aggressive, and then just kind of live with the results. And um, I think that's what made me feel more comfortable about taking the, you know, the trip overseas the first time and kind of allowed me to be comfortable in that first year and kind of figure out exactly how I could be successful uh, over here. Yo, man, I got I got a question. And this is just more so because, I mean, just running switch cultures and stuff, man. Sometimes the comments, man, they just kind of get on my nerves. So can you, for the fans, for the fans out there, can you explain yeah. to them? They always say, like, oh, why isn't he in the league? You know, all this other stuff. Like, can you, can you let them know what goes into the decision of taking the NBA job versus staying in Europe, in your situation now? Uh, I mean, for me personally, I can't speak on, you know, everybody else. But for me personally, I like to hoop. I'm a hooper to the core. I like to hoop. I like to play. I like to compete. There's a lot of guys that come over here thinking, you know, I'm just going over there to show what I can do so I can get back. And, you know, I kind of had that mindset early on, which is why I took that deal back in Boston. But then the, ne the next time I came over here, when I got to Ephesus, I was just like, I'm just going to ride this plane over here and see what I could turn this into. And whatever it takes me from there is where it takes me. And, you know, could I be in the league? For sure. Could I have signed – every single summer in the league yes but at the end of the day those opportunities that i had in the league weren't for me to necessarily get the you know the 20 25 minutes to go out there and show yourself it was more so like ah oh, we like them we're gonna have them come in training camp compete and sure you can go in there and win that job but also if you're going to let's say play off championship contending teams that see a guy in europe that could potentially help them if somebody gets hurt or something like that it's not necessarily the same opportunity that you have to be able to build yourself and grow as a player than I think you can have here. And for me personally, that's more so what it was. Every single year here, you know, I think I've gotten better. I've grown as a player. And uh, I think having the ability to have the responsibility every single night, day in and day out, to be responsible for, you know, game-winning plays, making decisions at the end of the game, having a big role in the offense, defensively having to lock up some of the better players, I think that is way more valuable than, you know, going back over to the NBA and and waiting for an opportunity. I'm over here showing who I am, and if somebody wants to give me that opportunity that I feel like I deserve, then okay, then I'll make that jump back. But until then, I'm perfectly fine, you know, growing and, you know, becoming one of the best players that is, has come over here. So um, that's more so why I don't go back to the league every single opportunity that I get, because if it's not the right opportunity where you're going to be able to play and show yourself um, as a hooper, as a guy who likes to hoop, you know, I feel like I would be unhappy and, and damn near miserable sitting on that bench every night, you know, waiting like this, trying to get an opportunity to get in the game, maybe not even taking my warm-up off. Uh, that's that's just not for me. So that's why I choose to, to stay over here until somebody, you know, gives me that opportunity to go back in and be a rotational guy. I think I think more and more people need to hear that. Like, even, even if it's not in the Saints, because it's hard, obviously, to reach the heights that you've reached. 
but to be able to yeah. to be content and find some comfortability or some some I guess yeah some comfortability overseas where it's like if a league opportunity or a different opportunity did come along where you just kind of like you know fuck it I'm here I'm cool you know what I'm saying I think right. that might be one of the most freeing feelings as an overseas hooper which is again yeah. that's part of the mental side that I just don't think I don't, I don't know how many overseas hooper really reached that point in their career you know what I'm saying? It might nah, be yeah, it's tough. One, two percent. So, um, but again, I think that's more of a mental thing um, and the way you approach the game. So I think that's dope to, to hear you say that. Yeah, I think you just got to buy in. You really just, if you love hoop, if you if you love to hoop and you your life, you love to hoop, then hoop. And if it means you got to be away from your family, away from your friends, away from America for 10 months, and you got to deal with these crazy coaches giving you punishment practices because y'all lose and payments be late. Hey, you, do you love hoop or not? Do you or do you not love hoop? That's what it's going to come down to. If you really love this thing, you got to sit here and deal with all of that. But we the, we the defending champs. But we lost a, a game this year, bro. We had like three-day camp. We don't go home. You staying at the hotel. We keep away from your family, your kids, your everything. We you staying in this hotel. Y'all not leaving. We having two practices a day. We watching film. Like, it's just part of it. And if you really love it, then it's just some things you gotta deal with coming with the with the territory over here. So, it's just, do you really love the hoop or not? That's that's what it come down to. Hey, what's what's the what's the craziest punishment y'all got, man? In your career, what's the craziest? Thing? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so I think my first year here, um, first year here, we were in first. We were in first place in the Turkish league, and <laughs> we lost to the last place team. We had just won a big year league game. It was like maybe two days later. We traveled back, didn't really have practice. The team was like a bunch of Turkish guys, and then they had two Americans, Tony Douglas, and um, this Landry Noko. No, 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 Cole. I don't know how to yeah, say his last yeah. name. Yeah. And they was playing for this team called Sicaria, bro. <laughs> yep. And we was feeling ourselves, blah, blah, blah. But I swear, combined, they probably gave us 65 and 33. Some crazy <laughs> numbers, bro, and we lost. My G, we got to the locker room. Usually, coach takes 5, 10, 15 minutes to come in there. But he came in there, immediately slammed the door behind him. He said, none of y'all change. All y'all go get in y'all car right now. We driving to the practice facility and we gonna run and shoot for two hours, bro. <laughs> I was like, huh? This is my first year back over here. I was like, huh? He could he could do this? I was like, I ain't going. They're like, all right, don't go. You gonna get that paycheck in a couple of days? It's gonna have a hefty fine in it. I was like, all right. So, bro, we all drove over there, bro. We in our game uniforms, bro. <laughs> game uniform, running, shooting shots at like eleven at night, bro. That was the craziest one that that we've been a part of since since I've been back over here, bro. It's definitely real. That it happened, bro. It's no jokes. Hey, man. for sure. Uh, that's that's wild. I can appreciate you. I can appreciate how you just uh, Charles Barkley, my man's name too. What do you say, Landry No 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 I I know who you talk about too. I don't know how to say his name either. Yeah, I don't know you talk about, but yeah. yeah. But look, man, you you yeah you done been through a lot clearly, but obviously it's paid off because you are essentially a celebrity, you know, in Turkey overseas, right? Like. Yeah. I was I think when I was in Gala when you was in Ephesus and we I seen you out one time and you had your hood up and you just walking around I was like Yo, why this nigga got his hood up like we we in Turkey like <laughs> like, yeah, we, like we in Turkey and then someone yeah. like someone had came up like I think someone noticed you and like a couple three four people just came up and tapped you right out right away I was like oh like like you know how it is in Europe like yeah. people know you but you was like. Right, but they LeBron. don't like that. Yeah, I was like, but this dude yeah, really nah. like LeBron in, in Istanbul. So I thought that was dope as hell. So yeah. I mean, I guess just talk about like how satisfying is that? Does that make you love the game even more? Um, and how satisfying was that? You know, obviously you said coming from Dallas in that situation to just be appreciated in that way. Yeah, I mean, it definitely makes you feel good. Obviously, you always want to be, you know, recognized for your talent, for your abilities. Um, so it, you know, it kind of gradually grew. First year was okay, had some good games, went to the final, won Turkish league, and I think you came up here during the second year because you came. When did you come? Right before? Yeah, like seven. Right before COVID? Nah. Yeah. 
Nah, it's like 17, 18, I think. I don't even remember. The first year. Yeah, yeah. So maybe it was the first year. I, was I remember, year but assignment. it was a gradual, you know, increase. And now I would say, you know, since I joined the national team, it's kind of even gone to a, another level where, you know, it's it's always enjoyable being recognized and, and everybody showing you love in the country. And, you know, it's <laughs> I don't really know how to explain it because, you know, it's, it's pros and cons to it because it's yeah. kind of annoying sometimes. But... Um, you know, I always take the time out to, to take pictures or try to communicate with the fans and, you know, just show the appreciation that I have for them because, you know, obviously it always makes you feel better when, you know, somebody wants to take a picture with you because of what you do on a basketball court, especially coming from America, being all the way across the world. Uh, it definitely makes it, you know, sweeter to, to kind of feel those emotions as opposed to nobody really caring about, you know, what you got going on. Yo, have you, uh, <laughs> I remember when I used to be in Europe, I used to always get like mistaken for a ce- American celebrity that looks nothing like me. <laughs> have you got any like wild ones? Uh, nah, not really. Uh, I don't think so. I think, I mean, not, I haven't been mistaken, but I've had people tell me I look like certain certain people. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like, oh, are you this dude? <laughs> like the weekend? I'm like, nah, but that ain't me. <laughs> But uh, they definitely come up and be like, you know, you look like this guy, and show you the picture. Like, yeah, nah, that ain't me though. <laughs> so that that be that be the that be the most annoying shit in the world. Japan would be the worst because they sure. really just tell you, you look like any random black dude. Like, like oh, that's <laughs> I, <laughs> like that's that. Drake. Like that's Drake. I'm like, man, first of all, that's racist as hell. <laughs> like, like, that's a, like low key, that's a hate crime. Like, come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't even look I heard. I've like heard that. that though. In Japan and China, is like that. I've heard crazy, that. Crazy, yeah, crazy, crazy. Sure. And me, even in America, I've been told I look like every any black dude you could think. Of. I got Chris <laughs> Duhon, Jay Williams. But I'm like, bro, uh, that's good. Know, that's because you went to school in Wisconsin. You know what I mean? Man, y'all, man, look, look y'all, 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 y'all recruit, y'all, y'all look, recruit players look, on a color wheel. Look, y'all don't go up. past a certain level on the crayon box. <laughs> Y'all got all light skins over there. Hey, yeah, I, I don't think y'all ever had a dark yeah. skin player in his. You hear, you hear, you hear Shane over here talking about true that. Like, man, fuck out of here. You fit with us. <laughs> oh, light bright ass, man. Watch out. Hey, light skin is in right now, but light skin is winning, dog. Always is. I can go either way depending on the crowd I'm rolling with. So you know, I'm right <laughs> true in the that. middle. <laughs> we have yeah. we have we have Marcus Landry though. He dark skin and Orlando okay. and Doe. You know what I'm saying? We had a couple. Beyond chocolate, yeah. uh, chocolate dudes, man. <laughs> <laughs> but look, man, give me your, give me your, uh, real quick, give me your Euro League All Star team, and then I got a follow up question for you. Give me your, your all Euro League team, whoever you want to pick. Give me eight guys. Eight guys, not yep. including myself. If you want it, I mean, uh, I would, I'd include you, but you could do whatever you want. All right, so I'll put me on there, Mike. Uh, Vasa, Vasily Mitic, Miritich. Um, we're going to go with the bigs. Tavares. Uh, I like Vizinkov. How many am I now? What, what, six? Six, yep. Six. Clyburn, Will Clyburn. And then, who's going to be my last one? I need another big, don't I? Yeah. I go. I go Vesely. I like Vesely. Vesely, nice. I go All right. Vesely. All right. Now I'm going to add any superstar you want to the team KD, LeBron, whoever you want. Pick one. For that team, we going to go. Damn, that's tough. I didn't know I could add an NBA superstar. Then it changed my whole roster. This well, this this the end. This the end. Now that that's your roster. You gotta add a superstar, whoever you want. I go KD. KD. All right. How many games y'all winning in the league? In the league with Can KD. Y'all... Yep. We gonna win by. We gonna be around five hundred. <laughs> we be right there around five hundred. So y'all get into the playoffs. We go get we in the east for sure. We in there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that, that's that's antiquated. That's outdated. The east better than the west now, for real. Man, I don't know about all that. I don't know. That's I cap. Don't know. That's I cap. I don't know. That. Oh. I don't know about that one. That's Top the cap? bottom. Top the bottom. 
Yeah, top to bottom. Top to bottom? That, Detroit, Orlando. Who is at the – Sacramento. Who else at the bottom of the, of the West? Sack got talent. Yeah, Sack got, Sack got talent, talent, though. though. They just uh, – You put mess. Sack they in the they East, they not at the bottom. And the Lakers had LeBron, and they suck. Listen. Okay, but that's the thing. Because the you West put is the tough. In the East, right. You put the Lakers in the East, then what? Hold on, hold on, hold on. See, this this wasn't even on schedule, but now <laughs> since, since you ain't on a time constraint, <laughs> we, we can take it here. You know what I'm saying? Ooh. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. This year, not 2014. This year. This year. Do we got the? Can we pull up the uh, the standings real quick? Hold on. I got the standings right here. Who are you trying we to got, see at the bottom of the East? Bottom me, of the East. You got the Magic, can't. the Pistons, the Pacers, the Wizards. You just, Knicks. the Wizards. First of all, the Wizards with Brad Beal is solid. They decent. They started off the year good and then got injured. So they always you know start the year off whatever. And then no, nah, they started trash. off trash last year and ended up good. See, you just over there talking, man. But yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> by and large, by and large, they they trash. Hold on. Like in the West, Portland, the West. OKC, Houston, Sacramento, San Antonio. But they San playing. They pl- playing. Don't do that. They were. <laughs> yeah, they were. San Antonio is solid. <laughs> San Antonio was 34 and 48. Top, man, top to bottom, the top West. To bottom. Got more t- Sacramento is more talented than Orlando. Sacramento is more talented than Sacramento, not Indiana. more talented than Washington. Without, I mean, once Washington traded all those dudes, yeah. Without Dinwiddie, Brad was hurt. Then they brought Porzingis, mm-hmm. but, I mean, then who was getting Porzingis the ball? Nah, okay, but we just talk about talent now. Nah, I mean, I don't know who is getting in the ball. So, Sadaransky, ain't he about to be your teammate potentially? Yeah, him, see? You know, no, I mean, he's cool. <laughs> he's talented. Nah, but uh, listen, New York, Washington, Charlotte, Cleveland, Atlanta, Brooklyn, Chicago, Toronto, Philly, Milwaukee, Boston, Miami. Who is the, who is the nine the in the East? Charlotte? Cleveland. Cleveland ended up nine? Yeah. See, you was busy with your playoff. Who is, who is Charlotte? Was who, what Charlotte ended up? 10? 10. 10. All right, Charlotte is 10. Who was 10 in the West? San Antonio. San Antonio. Charlotte was 43 and 39. San Antonio is 34 and 48. And I ain't just going on records. New Orleans was what? Just, New Orleans was what? New Orleans nine? was eight. 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 It was eight at 36 eight. and 46. Now, New Orleans against who was the eight and what's the name? In the, Atlanta. In Brooklyn? Atlanta. Atlanta. Who better? New Orleans, Atlanta. Without Zion? This with the rosters as they were, Atlanta. Atlanta. Oh no, dog. Not a very Atlanta. tough series. Out of nah, Atlanta. New Orleans is clicking. Close, New Orleans though. is clicking towards the end. New Orleans was clicking. New Orleans was clicking. Got some clicking. Going on. Listen, but they got but some if going on but there. so Zion didn't play, so I'm taking him off. But if John Collins and Capella healthy, like not missing the time that they missed at the time that they did, you know what I'm saying? Then Atlanta's not an eight seed. I, nah, I feel that. I feel that. I don't know, man. It's tough. It's tough. But it's definitely it, it's closer close. than it used it's getting, to be. Yeah, it's getting, it's getting even. It's starting Listen, to even out. It's starting Listen, to even out. The Lakers suck. I tried to watch them all year long. I want them to be good all year long. They suck. So <laughs> just because they got LeBron, they stink. They struggle. They Listen. Struggle. They were too old, bro. They were too old. Yeah. We, we had yeah, we, not one person who wanted to play defense. Nobody. Man, we had, like I said, we had Elijah on last week, your teammate, and I said, we always talk about, you know, the NBA team when a good EuroLeague come along. I said, y'all was the team that I was like, oh, y'all really might have, like, the way y'all play with y'all guards and all that, y'all would have swept the Lakers. <laughs> <laughs> y'all would have beat them three times. <laughs> I, I ain't going to say that. But yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I am. The way they were defending, we had a chance. And the way AD was playing, Dunstan would have held him to six and eight. <laughs> what, what, what rules we playing with, though? We playing with that, that, yeah. we playing with NBA. Yeah, rules. That, that's, a, that's a big key. It don't matter. If we can close that paint on them. We be all right. Hey, man, roll the ball out. But yeah, I, I really don't think it's close. Like East and West this year. Like Houston is trash. OKC was not good. Portland was not good. Sacramento was not good. LA was not good. San Antonio was not good. It's getting even. 
But as a whole, with everybody's healthy, the West is stronger for sure. But okay, how many teams you just named? Sixteen. Well, everybody, everybody wasn't healthy though. Yeah, five, sixteen, sixteen, sixteen. Yeah, but I'm saying when everybody's Orlando, healthy, Detroit. if you look at the rosters, if every, I'm just different. talking about this year with the you said the rosters with people that played, the East was better. I don't know about better. It's close. I mean, you. Yeah. I mean, it depends on who you want to talk to. Yeah, it's close yeah. though. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Close, man. Y'all niggas stuck in a time warp in 2016. <laughs> that shit. That shit. <laughs> but nah, man. So anyway, moving on, moving on. Cause we got to get to the to the pressing topics. Um, we had a conversation last week where a lot of your teammate again talked about some legacy, uh, legacy or money. Um, so for you, I guess, what what's more important? Uh, what has become more important? I guess the older you've gotten, you're gonna leave a crazy legacy in Europe. Um, like you said, you love the game. What kind of drives you to do what you've done? Uh, I mean, definitely legacy. I think you know at this point, I've made I've made good money. Uh, so now it's just about how far I can take it. Um, I don't know where where that is. What's next? What opportunities coming? But um, I think legacy is definitely more important at this point at my age i'm about to be 30 this year so just seeing as how far i could take it what i can what else i can accomplish in my career you know i've done some some things over here individually and as a team that you know i i had set out to do things that i wanted to do and now that i've done those things i think it's just about you know how much further i could take it what other things i can accomplish and what new goals i can set for myself and and see what you know what opportunities i get to to be able to go out there and accomplish those things We've talked about before, like that European accomplishment should get you into the to the Hall of Fame. I forgot who who we had on here talking about that, Ed, but we've talked about that. Do you think that like, so the career you've had in Europe should hold more weight than mm-hmm. say like if you was the seventh man in the NBA or no? Tough, bro. Tough, tough, tough situation because. At the end of the day, the NBA is a different level. I think we all can agree to that. Um, of you know, obviously, there's differences within the game, and individual players have different levels of success at different places. Um, but I think if you're the seventh man on a, you know, a, you know, I'm let's say I'm a, one of the most important players on a team that just went back to back. I don't know if that holds more weight than a seventh man on, you know, one of those Lakers teams that three-peated or, you know, the Golden State team that went back-to-back. Like Andre Iguodala, I think he was probably like sixth, seventh man on one of those teams. I think that holds, you know, a little more weight than, you know, going back-to-back over here. But, I mean, it's definitely not easy. It's challenging over here. To, I think the playoff system over here with one game wins it all where, you know, you can have an off day and kind of lose a championship based on that. I think that makes it tougher to win win things over here because – not necessarily the best team wins every time, but I mean that's that's a I don't think it's at a level yet here where you can say that kind of trumps being a seventh man on a back to back champion of the league. I think that's still is a different different level. Okay. Yeah, I think like I mean I <clears throat> when I look at uh basketball in general or the basketball hall of fame in general, um I mean I think that obviously the NBA is a whole nother level but when you have somebody that's doing something that is pretty much unheard of or difficult to do at any level, you know what I'm saying? And I think that, you know, and I think what we were talking about it last time, I mean, the amount of Final Fours that Kyle Hines has been to, you know, has been to, I mean, I feel like it deserves consideration. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, there's, I mean, even going back to back and like, let's say that, you know, y'all three-peat, you know, in EuroLeague, like, I really don't know too many NBA players that you could just put on a EuroLeague team and do right. nine Final Fours, however many Kyle has done, you know what I'm saying, and do these type of things. So it's just like, you know, when you look at it in the scope, in that scope, man, I, I think that it deserves it deserves con- consideration. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it definitely deserves consideration. I think, you know, as the EuroLeague continues to grow and I think as, you know, if they can get – if they can get it more closer to, you know, like the concept, like how the NBA has, where it's just one individual league and not, you know, you don't have all the domestic league stuff going on as well. I think if you can get, you know, 20 teams to kind of buy their way out of the domestic league and just truly create a Euro league where it's just Euro league teams, you can have like a draft, the TV rights broadcasted around the world. I think if it can get to a certain level where it has more of a global impact 
outside of just Europe. I think then more of those things that have happened in the past where, you know, Joko has all the championships he has, Pants and Eichels has all those rings, Kyle been in nine Final Fours, won four of them. Like, if you can get it to a level like that where it's globally recognized for how great of a league it actually is, then I think, you know, you have a better chance at it or it's going to get more consideration because more people are going to look and dive into the history of, you know, what has already made the league what it is because without you know all those team successes Seska going to 14 out of 16 final fours I think people will start really going into those you know into that history and kind of understanding how much you know talent and ability is over here as opposed to you know kind of being recognized as oh just the second best league in the world I think people will kind of understand exactly what it is and how important basketball is to these people over here and how challenging it actually is and all the little things that go into it so I think as the game continues to grow, yearly continues to grow and take on new heights, different levels, I think possibly then, you know, it can get that level of consideration that, you know, it deserves. Yeah, yeah, maybe and maybe I shouldn't have said Trump. I should have just said it should it shouldn't be diminished that you're doing that in Europe. It should yeah. definitely be more consideration. But Europe going to new heights, does that mean does that mean it's gotta separate from the domestic leagues and you know what I mean? I mean, that's the tough thing. I have had this conversation many times because it's like I know that if you take, let's say in Turkish League, if you take FS and Fenner out of the Turkish League, it hurts the Turkish League by a lot. And you don't want to do that to your, your country. So it's difficult. Uh, you take Barcelona, Basconia, and Madrid out of the ACB. It's like, all right, who? I mean, maybe you get a different winner every single year, but you're not going to have that fan support of you know going to see these top teams with the biggest budgets play against each other it's kind of kind of hurt the league so it's going to be tough I don't, I don't know if it ever actually gets done but the ideal of it if you can you know think about not think about the domestic league if you can really create a euro league where let's say you have like 18 teams some teams in turkey some teams in spain maybe you put a team like in, in paris you put a team in london you put a team in you know these desirable cities in europe I feel like you would get many more, you know, players that, you know, Americans, you know, guys from all over the world that would want to come play and be part of this league because it would have that NBA concept where you're not playing, you're playing back-to-backs. One night you're in Paris, one night you're in Istanbul, one night you're in Athens, next night you're in Madrid. And I think that kind of, that kind of potential for a league would, you know, make other guys want to come be a part of it as opposed to, you know, the grinded out schedule that it is where, you know, you got one international competition, you fly back home, practice, then you got domestic league. And it's like kind of different levels of competition. I think if you can really get it to that level, then I think the league can, you know, go to new heights. And um, it's going to be tough. But I think that's something that if, you know, certain teams or certain owners or certain, you know, clubs are interested in doing, if you can get, you know, 10, 15 teams to buy in and possibly get, you know, some of these billionaires in, in you know, the UK to want to have basketball teams. I think if you can get, you know, that kind of global scale and kind of grow the the idea or the passion for basketball in the UK, I think that will help a lot because that will bring in a lot of money to the sport, new fan bases. Like if you can get Liverpool or Man United or Man City or – Chelsea, some of these teams that have all these followers, all this money to kind of buy into basketball and kind of build up the culture there, I think then you'll have more of an ability to kind of put money into the league, get broadcasting deals, TV deals, sponsorships, and then maybe be able to get it to that point where it's truly like an NBA format where you got to draft every year from, you know, some of these kids in Serbia that are going straight to the NBA and kind of just grow the the base of the league to, to become more, but it's going to be tough, and, you know, I, you know, I would like to be a part of, you know, pushing that culture, pushing that, you know, agenda and trying to make it that way. But at the end of the day, I have, you know, no idea what goes on behind the scenes at this moment. So I know I just know it'll be tough. You got something, man? No, nah, man, I mean, I, I agree. There, I know there's a, there's one of the uh, the owners of the football teams in uh, London. I know he bought one of the teams uh, out there. And the league is growing out there. They're starting to get more fans, and you know they're getting, uh, they're doing things right. They're trending in the right direction, but they still a ways off. But I think within the next five years, I, I think they're going to make a push to have a Euro League team there. And uh, I think the whole, I think Paris will have one too. 
You got to have yeah. one in every major city in Europe. Like, it's right. got to happen. It's got to happen. Got to. Got to. Man. <clears throat> that being said, with, uh, you know, I, th- I think they should just get rid of domestic leagues altogether. <laughs> that's, 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 tough, tough. I mean, it's tough to do. I know it's tough to do, but it don't make no yeah. sense. It don't make no sense. At least they got to change something in terms of the way they format it, because it don't make no sense that y'all just won the Euro League, and then you got to go play. I don't know, Karshaka in the Karshaka in the three game series. Like, come on, man, how y'all even supposed to play during that? Like, if I was the coach, I'd have been like, listen, we forfeit. Hey, do y'all? Hey, do y'all? Do y'all think it would? uh, Do you think you think players would ever have the power in Europe to just sign over and be like, and I'm just playing Euroleague? You think players? Yeah, Shane got that. Yeah, Shane do. What you mean? Shane gonna lead the way. (laughs) Shane gonna lead the way. (laughs) I'm Turkey. He gonna lead the revolution. (laughs) I'm Turkish. I'm on a roster every weekend. Every weekend, I'm on a roster. Turkish, so I'm on there. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, I think there is going to be a, an ability to sign those kind of contracts. Uh, I just think, I don't think you can sign for as much money because if you think about it, you're only playing in one league and they're going to be like, all right, well, if you're only playing in one league, then I mean, we only going to pay you half the amount that we would have paid you if you playing both. So I think it's tough, but it's also to the domestic th- league thing. It's like you got a lot of kids in Turkey that love playing basketball. You get rid of that domestic league, then what? Where are they gonna go and play basketball, bro? <laughs> like, you, that's uh, messed right. up. At you the park? <laughs> nah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Turkey, bro. Athens, like a uh, Turkey, Athens, Serbia. Like people love, they love basketball. They love the sport. So it's like if you get rid of the domestic league, sure, you know some of these kids in these countries aren't gonna play in the Euro League or the Euro Cup, Champions yeah. League or NBA. <laughs> But hey, they can they, play, you know. In they, the they gonna have or, to. Uh, they gonna have to get a job like the, these Americans out here <laughs> that lead college right, and can't continue right, their right. career. They gonna have H- to get a job and go hoop right. in the Drew League. H and R block. H and R block. Play for the company team, bro. <laughs> what you mean? Get you a job up at the school, man. Hoop with the kids. Teach basketball. By the time Europeans yeah, yeah. is spoiled, man. <laughs> I feel you. I feel you. I feel you. I <laughs> is spoiled, but <laughs> you know, man. Hey, we want to touch on, on Jalen Brown's situation too. He just signed a signed a deal with Donda, Donda Sports, Sports, man. So I know I'm sure you got some thoughts on that. Were you in Boston with him? Yeah, you was with him for a minute, right? Yeah, yeah. I was yeah. JB for a little bit. So, so I I don't know him personally, but he just seemed like he got a very like thoughtful, eclectic personality. Yeah, so when I saw he's he, when I saw he signed with Kanye, I was like, that makes. That makes a lot of sense. So, I guess one, where do, what do you think about that? Would be the first question. Um, and um, then, yeah, go ahead. Um, I mean, I think you know, I, obviously, there's probably a lot of very specific writing in that contract that he signed. But like you said, JB's a smart kid, um, so I don't think he would sign no no BS contract and you know give up everything that's coming his way um, for anything stupid. Um, so obviously you would have to see the contract and see everything that goes into it. I'm sure he has some type of creative, you know, control on something within his, you know, marketing or something that goes into that. Um, but in terms of on the basketball side of it, at a certain point, it's like, how much does your agent really do for you? If you Jalen Brown, you just, you know, are the number two scorer on an NBA Finals team. You're 24 years old. You're super athletic. You already made one All Star team. I mean, he don't really need the greatest agent in the world. If I was his agent, if any of y'all his agents, we gonna be able to go get him two hundred million, you know. So I think he kind of looked at it in that way and was kind of, you know, I think JT uh, JB's a leader. I think he wants to, you know, create different pathways for the younger generation. And I think that, you know, obviously it's somewhat of a risk because he's not going with the already established agency. But um, like I said, I think he would make a, a good decision, and we wouldn't, you know risk anything in his future by signing that so you know i'm interested to see how it all plays out um but uh, and hopefully it all it all works out the way that he wants it to 
is yeah i think i think with this move i think with this move it'd be it'd be more important to to see what he does off the court with it right you know what i mean exactly. i think you know I, I think like you said anybody can go out there and get him 200 mil but i think you know he he seems like the type of person and i think that he's at a point in his career where he's he's playing a long game and he's right. uh He's trying to, you know, set some building blocks for, you know, uh, something bigger. So I'll be, I, I be paying more attention to what he's doing off the yeah. court, you know, in these coming years. For sure. Or well, he about to drop a mixtape with a with a yay feature. <laughs> one, of the, <laughs> one of the two. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> yeah, that social justice track that they about to drop for sure. <laughs> that might be <laughs> Yo, 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 yo. yo. Yo, here's a question for both of y'all. Who is the who is the best and worst rapper y'all had as teammates in your career? Best and worst rapper I had as teammates. <laughs> Damn, let me think. Damn. Whichever I mean, one best, comes first to mind, yeah. Best probably Mount Shumpert. Probably the best. I mean, he he's actually mm -hmm. made some track. So I yeah, would say good. probably best in mind. Worst? Shoot, I don't even know. I don't even know. I don't even like officially or just like somebody who just be freestyling and just ain't never, never sounded good. It could it, like, it could be whatever. It could be whatever, man. I, one of my teammates now, actually, when we were in Basconia, he was a little young at the time. Roddy Bouba. Yeah. He, like, he, he would freestyle in French. And then all of a sudden he started learning English. I was like, all right, let me hear some of the English. And he'll try. I'm like, yeah, but you might as well just stick to that, to the French freestyle. Well, I don't know what you're saying. Because when he tried to rhyme and stuff in English, that joint never never came out right. So I would say he probably the worst one. Hey, yeah, hit him with, hey, man. Everybody trying to hear that bullshit? <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, your ass up. Mine my, right. my, right. my was probably, the worst is probably myself. Uh, I can't rap for shit. <laughs> I can sing like Luther though. But the best is probably uh light skin. <laughs> like, I mean, light skin <laughs> Listen, man, I'm just, I'm just telling you the truth, man. I'm just telling you the truth. Look, right. but the the best is actually I don't know if I had a lot of good. Uh, you know, I'm I gotta give it to my, my Spanish teammate, this dude Sebastian Size. I was with him this year. He actually he actually solid. He be rapping in Spanish, he got a nice little flow. He actually decent. Oh. He he was actually I was shocked to be honest, cause he a goofy goofy ass dude. That's my bad, but he, he was solid. Yeah, nah, I had a I had a college teammate, uh, Jeremy Green. He was he he was legit. Like he used to uh, he could spit, but uh, I say the worst, and I don't even know if he was that bad, but it just used to annoy me. Was uh, D Brown um, when I was D Brown? I used to hoop at Illinois. No, look great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We was teammates in Italy, bro, and he his, his apartment was right under mine. And he never adjusted <laughs> to the time. So he's up all night, and he used to just be rapping and freestyling. I think I told the story on the podcast earlier, but I remember we used to drive an hour and a half to Rome, bro, and, like, he played his whole mixtape. So we got through, we got through, like, the first, like, we got through, we got through the whole thing. It was, like, 50 minutes. And I'm thinking he about to put something else on, and he, he run that thing back. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, hell no. Hey, you, <laughs> I'm gonna take a taxi back <laughs> by any means. Hey, you I can't do it again. You, you heard it, but you yeah. wasn't listening, huh? <laughs> wow. Man. You heard it. You, <laughs> did you actually let him run it back? Man, I wasn't driving. It was my oh, first year nah. in Europe. I was like a rookie in Europe. I wasn't about to say nothing, man. Nah, I just had to like you, stomach it, but. You a better man, man than me. Uh, I would have ran that Zero car Hooper rappers, road. man. <laughs> you are a better right. man than me. Fuck that. <laughs> like, fuck that, man. Hey, but it, the final, the finals coming up. So two questions in honor of uh, first of all, honor of J.R. Smith. You got to give us what's your worst. What's y'all both? This for everybody. What's your worst uh, big game blunder? Worst mistake you ever made in a big game? Worst big game blunder. Mm. I don't even know if I had something that bad. I would say probably this this year we were playing in the in the I was in, with the national team. 
against uh, we were playing Greece at home in front of all of our fans, and it was my first time playing with like a, a packed gym here in Turkey. And I had like I think five, six turnovers, and I had a a bad turnover late in the game where I just dribbled it off my foot when I we were down by three or five or something like that. So I would say that's probably in the recent memory that's probably my worst mid game blunder. That ain't too bad. <laughs> that ain't too bad. <laughs> no, nah, I remember I was in a I was in a cup game and. Uh... Man, it was like late. It was one of those games I was getting off in the first half, and then the second half started off kind of slow or whatever. And it was uh, it was fourth quarter, and I might have had a bucket or two right before that, but it's like late game, might be tied down one, something like that. I wave everybody to the baseline. <laughs> like, everybody, just get out the way. I got it. I don't want no screen. <laughs> like, I got it. it was at that I'm in my <laughs> – <laughs> got ripped. <laughs> and it was one of those <laughs> – it was one of those joints where you know I'm going I'm going hard one direction uh, and I get ripped without the ball like you slip and then you just oh, watching man. the play on like from the floor laying on the ground watching that joint going the other way. I was like, damn. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <Shit. laughs> Mine was probably actually I did it this year. We had a game two go to for seeding in the playoffs and it was like one of them close games, kind of you know bang bang, kind of low scoring. We had got to stop. We, had, we was down like eight, cut it to like four. Momentum was changing. And uh, what happened? The ball like rolled to the corner, so I chased the rebound down. I'm tired, so I'm looking at trying to get a play. I'm walking the ball up the floor. Next thing you know, beep, I look up, 15 on the clock. <laughs> mm-hmm. I was, uh, See. My coach, I got a Serbian coach. This man sat down over there talking about some, fuck, fuck, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, bro, my bad, but chill. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I see, I see Jordan Poole do that in the Warriors game the other day too. I was happy as hell because I was telling everybody like, man, it ain't just me. Ain't just bro, Elijah me, did that joint last week, uh, about two weeks ago in, in the Car Shaker series. He did it. See, yeah. They were playing some little press, some little press. I passed it to him with like 17. <laughs> he caught it, chilled for a second, took one dribble, picked it up right before the line. Eight seconds. <laughs> 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 He ain't All telling us right. all that. <laughs> he ain't even yeah. telling us all that. <laughs> <laughs> we had like two weeks ago, but yeah, it was oh, man. No, that's funny. Nah, but uh moving forward, man. So we're about to uh we about to get into some sneaker culture, man. As uh you know, I know you you somewhat of a sneaker head, man. I remember we did that uh the little lifestyle piece last season, man. You had all them kicks, man. You was pulling kicks out under the stairwell, man. He's putting them in uh right. in the linen closet. He got kicks right. everywhere. But uh right. but yeah, man, sneaker culture has evolved in many ways, you know, over the years, man. It's always had like a political pl- presence with like Black Lives Matters colorways and all different kind of things and even dating back to uh you know, the early 1900s and stuff like that. And then there's just always been a, uh, a presence in like sports and music. And, you know, nowadays it's kind of seesawing between, you know, being rare and unaffordable and then this whole right. resale culture. Um, where do you think, what do you think is the next evolution in sneaker culture? Um, you know, you think there's going to be like collabs with crypto, cryptocurrencies or, you know, what, yeah. what do you see as uh, being the next step? I, I mean, I think you just nailed it. I think it's probably going to head in that direction. I think that's the hot thing right now, cryptocurrency. So, you know, I can see, like, certain shoes becoming raffles. Um, and if you get lucky enough to get one of those shoes, maybe you get on one of these white lists or something like that. So I think, you know, probably in that direction, I think the whole resale culture has, you know, kind of tainted the, the sneaker culture in, in general and in a, in a sense because it's many people out there that's not even really sneaker heads that's going out to try to get sneakers. People just going out there for the cash. So, um, I mean, I understand it. I mean, it's a hustle. It's part of it. But um, now I wish it wasn't so easy to, you know, be able to stand in line for hours for a shoe and then just flip it for thousands of dollars later on. I think people who truly, genuinely want the shoes and enjoy the shoes should be able to get in those lines. But, I mean, everything, everything revolves around money nowadays. So, um, I don't know if what you can do about that. But I would say, yeah, you, you hit it right on the head, I think definitely being some kind of involved in cryptocurrency with certain sneakers or certain releases um in that kind of kind of atmosphere is probably where where it's headed next does crypto does crypto solve some of that stuff are you crypto you into crypto like that not really i mean I, I understand some of it but i ain't, I ain't really big into it yeah i'm gonna be interesting to see if crypto actually solves like you said you know kind of weeds out some of the people from the resale market and yeah. stuff like that <laughs> 
I mean, yeah, maybe. I don't, like I said, I don't really try to pay too much attention to it. I'm, I'm black and white. I don't, I don't really get into all the extra. I let my <laughs> finance people handle handle all that. <laughs> finance people. I hope that's what I do. That's how, that's how you <laughs> know you. Man, my, my finance people is my dad, so you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you know you big time talking about my finance people. <laughs> Love to see it. Love to see it. <laughs> what do you say? Love to see a black man get paid. <laughs> hey, but yo, but we're going to move on from that, though, man. Um, obviously, you know, I'm sure you annoyed hearing this question, but obviously your dad, Barry Larkin, baseball player, Hall of Fame baseball player. And you see now this wave of professional athletes with Clay, Steph, who got fathers, parents, whatever that, you know, came from the professional ranks at a high level. So how much of a of advantage uh, was that to have, you know, being in the Reds dugouts like that growing up, even though it was baseball? How, how, how advantageous was that as opposed to, you know, having a dad who's a, uh, I don't know, who work at, you know, the post office or financial advisor? Um, you know, I think I saw early on what it took to, to be successful in that in that world. Um, like you said, it's different sports, but, you know, the grind and the commitment to, to whatever you're trying to accomplish, I, I learned very early on. I know, my dad was, you know, one of the best high-level Hall of Famer, all-star every single year, Golden Gloves, Silver Sluggers. He did all the, all the individual accolades, but he never changed his, you know, his perception of who he was or what he wanted from the game. He enjoyed it. He loved it. And he put everything he had into the game. He was the captain of the team. So he could have, you know, you know, taken the easy way out. He could have slacked. He could have chilled. He could have just, you know, laid back. And once he had all those things, he could have just been like, all right, man, I ain't going to go do this extra bat in practice. I ain't going to go field extra balls. I ain't showing up early to, to, to spring training. I'll come, you know, two weeks before, before the regular season starts and do all that. But he was always one of the first people there, one of the last people to leave, you know, I remember even at the house when he came home in the off season, he had a, a batting thing in the backyard. He was out there throwing the ball at me mad hard, trying to get me to, you know, push him. <laughs> so, you know, I just saw the level of commitment very early on of what it took to be successful at these levels. Cause I also saw the other side of it where my dad would be talking to these guys and say, you need to commit at this level. You need to be here when I'm here. Cause he was the captain trying to, you know, bring the young guys along. And a lot of those young guys would be like, all right, I'm going to come. But then the few that wouldn't, you, I would see how quickly they would just kind of fade away and they wouldn't ever amount to anything. So I saw early on at the age of four, five, six, seven, growing up within the dugout, like you said, seeing those guys who put the work in that were able to attain some level of, you know, success and be able to, you know, maintain and, and head in the right direction versus the guys who wouldn't. So I think that was probably the biggest advantage of, you know, growing up in that atmosphere with my father being who he was and, um, regardless of sport, being able to take the the small things away from it that that you need to take in order to be able to sustain a, a level of success in this sports world. What are what are some of the disadvantages? I guess because you know obviously people talk about that, but what's some of like the cons to that? Um, I mean, I'll say just the cons are is like you got to build, you got to have a, you got to have tough skin early on because everybody gonna talk about you just because they just cause you know you. I grew up with you know a very famous father in the city that you know he was born in cincinnati ohio i was born in cincinnati ohio he played for cincinnati my mom's from cincinnati his whole family from cincinnati so they were kind of like they were kind of like the cosby family in cincinnati like we grew up and it was just hella people always on you know at the mall people all you know surrounding us you know leaving the games as a you know, kid, people banging on you on the window. Like, you don't really understand because you don't understand who your dad is at that age, at, you know, four, three, four years old. But seeing it um, and not really understanding why your dad's never home, you know, you then eventually, you know, we moved to, to Florida away from, from my dad because that that atmosphere was so crazy that he was just, he didn't feel comfortable us, us being there. He didn't want us to go to school there because he knew all the things that could potentially happen so I think that's probably the biggest disadvantage that that there was just not being able to spend the time that you would want to spend with your dad that's doing all these great things and um I would say that's probably probably the biggest disadvantage because other than that you know if you get if you build tough skin and you don't let like the stupid comments of ah you know when you when I'm nine years old ten years old and I'm cooking people like oh you only doing that because your daddy got money and he's paying for the trainers and da 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 
Like, but he ain't paid them to let me cook you, so no. Nah, <laughs> so, you know, I think that <laughs> so I think that's just kind of like the skin that you kind of got to grow early on. And uh, if you build that, then I think, you know, it's kind of, you know, easy going from then on out. See, is it, was it, was it, see, my dad, my dad, he's, a, he's in finance. And this dude used to get on my nerves when we would be have me in the gym talk, just trying to push me, talking about you got to do this, you know what I'm saying? You know how dad, they push yeah. you. So I can't only imagine how annoying having a professional athlete is at that because he probably he probably on your ass at oh, all yeah. times. He was on me. <laughs> it didn't matter what sport it was, he was on me. He, but I mean, it was a it was a good thing because yeah. you know it, it taught me early on. Like I remember playing football when I was eight years old and tackle football. And one time I was always fast. One time I got rocked. I was <laughs> just just completely rocked. I was playing up because I wanted to play. I got rocked and I was on the sideline. I was laying there crying. He came down there. <laughs> he was like, "You all right?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'm sorry." He's like, he, he like grabbed my arm. He was like, "Anything broke?" He like, I'm like, ah, "No, nah, I don't think so." He said, like, "Can you get up?" I was like, "Yeah." I think he was like, "I right, try." And I was like, yeah. "I did like a little little movement, trying to act like I was a little more hurt." <laughs> Man took my face mask like this, grabbed it, and boom, slammed me back into the ground. Like, don't you ever let nobody hit you like that again, though. <laughs> I am embarrassing me. I'm like, damn, bro, my bad. I got rocked. You worry about everybody else. <laughs> so I think dude, just those kind of like little lessons early on, bro. It's just like you, you remember those things so well. That's like, you know, even he was my basketball coach from probably like 10 to 13. And he was just all, he was just like competitive. He was just like defense first, defense, defense, defense. And he was the coach, so he was. I wouldn't be playing defense, or my man was scoring on me. He'll put me on the bench for like two quarters, and put me back in that late. So just like little things that you know he he did for a reason. I didn't really understand it then, but you know later on, as I've grown up and I've kind of understood how all this stuff worked, now I understand the lessons and the values that he tried to implement early through sports. Uh, that kind of helped me, you know, become whoever whoever I've become. So. But it was it was it was crazy sometimes. <laughs> so hypothetical for y'all, if Shane Larkin, same person, doesn't have Barry Larkin as a daddy, someone else as a dad, or Steph Curry got I don't know, not Dale Curry as a dad, is it the same same outcome? You know what I'm saying? You know, what I'm saying? Do, you, do you get the same? Does there is that? Is that like the the link? Other than obviously your talent, but is that how important is that? I guess is what I'm trying to ask. Um, I mean that's a that's a tough question, dog. I mean I don't know how yeah, that's why I asked it. You know how you can even? <laughs> <laughs> it's like I I mean I think if you if you genuinely have the passion, you know which I, you know I've always loved basketball. I always had the passion for it, and even when he wasn't pushing me to be you know get extra shots or anything, I was the one out there doing my thing. I was always out there when he was doing his thing and playing baseball in Cincinnati. I was still at the crib getting shots up until my mama told me dinner was ready. So I was still, I still loved it so much that I think I would have had the talent and the passion to, to be able to push myself to reach some level. I don't know if I would have, you know, reached the level that I reached because, you know, a lot of that comes from the values and things that I learned from my dad early on. But, you know, I think I would have still had the passion in order to push myself individually to, you know, whatever heights I would have, I would have been able to reach. But same level, I mean, I, Hypothetically, I don't even know. So <laughs> tough. What you think, Aunt Steph? Steph right? is Steph without Dell. What uh, you think? I mean, I think I think when uh when you get to that level, I mean, there's, I mean, a part of it is skill. Part of it is you know uh, being pushed. But I think a lot of it is just your personality and your mentality. You know what I mean? Yeah. The uh, you know a lot of guys that reach like the higher levels of any sport. It's a mentality thing, man, that, you know, you whether you're an alpha or you just super disciplined or you just get hyper focused. Um, so I think that uh, I think that's more the key determinant than um, obviously having a, a dad that's played professional sports, man. You learn like a lot of shortcuts and you have access to different things that I think do help also. So maybe you won't maximize your potential, but I think the majority of that potential is just, you know, what's between the ears and just how you are, you know, as a person. Yeah, right. yeah, no, I, I would probably agree with that. Like, 
That's just in you. I mean, I guess part of that is, uh, you know, I think most dads, like you said, kind of bring that quality to to their kids, you know what I'm saying, put that toughness in them, a lot of them at least. Um, but, yeah, the, the shortcuts thing is obviously a big thing. But just like you said, putting those qualities of working hard and, and loving something, regardless whether you're – There's a lot of trash Hall of Fame sons out there. There's a lot of them out there now. Trash? Trash, yes, trash. Trash. <laughs> Who trash? Who trash? I mean, the no, goat. Say, nah, the they goat were, I knew you was good. They not trash, though. They D1, they D1 basketball. <laughs> Look at that. What is they, though? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is they? This is no disrespect, but what is they, bro? Come on. Hey, listen, listen. That's that's hella disrespectful. <laughs> wow. yeah, no, I'm fucking right. with you. <laughs> no, I mean, they wasn't. Look, look. Marcus was solid. Marcus was solid. One of them was cool. One of them was all right. The other one was at Illinois. You you a D one basketball player. You all right? In the a, in the Big Ten. Did he get a scholarship to Illinois? Yeah, look, look, he investigating now. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not being <laughs> no, no, that is, I was I thinking know. one of them was a walk on. No, I think I, I think he was I, a scholarship. I one cat. was a walk on. I think he was at Illinois uh, when man, I was Marcus at Wisconsin. Marcus might have been a walk on. Right? Marcus was lefty, right? Nah, the other one. Marcus was the one with bounce. He had some hop. Who played at UCF? Marcus. He was lefty? Yeah, I think Marcus was he lefty. Okay, so, okay, yeah, he was all right. He yeah. Was all right. And the other Jeff, one was shorter. Wasn't he yeah, shorter? Yeah, he was small. He was at, he was at Illinois. Nah, when I he was walked on at Illinois, bro. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's no way he had a scholarship, dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ain't, ain't no, no chance. <laughs> yeah. no you know, I was thinking, you don't even know his think, name. Hey, is is right. uh, is, is you don't Jeff, even know his name. Is, That's not... is Jeffrey. Talking about the other one. <laughs> <laughs> it's Jeffrey. It's Jeffrey, yo. I think. I know he was number thirteen, though. I know that. Man, I know, man. You said he was at he was at Illinois when you was at Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He got in the game. <laughs> Couple times, yeah, he was out there. He was out there. I, when, I was, when I was when I was at Stanford, Little Romeo got in the game too. Man, but he was, he was a goddamn walk on. <laughs> he was a goddamn walk on. His high school there. team was cold though. That was a, yeah, Little yeah. Romeo high school team was cold. Demar, hey, hey, you team or high school team? Did they go to high school together too? Hey, hey, you, I know they was they was oh, solid. Man. Hey, you, they yeah, was yeah, they was solid. Demar brought his black ass to USC as well. Hey, you know, I, I, I almost I almost forgot too. Hold on, you said that people said y'all was like the you was like the Cosby family in Cincinnati. Yeah, that's who you look like. You look like Alvin. <laughs> I got no comment. We got to edit it. We got to put that side by side one time for the for the people. (laughs) No comment. You ain't got nothing. All right. I ain't got nothing for you, bro. Hey, but but we 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 got a couple more. We gonna let you up out of here, man. We gonna backtrack a little bit. Just to the continuity, continuity piece we was talking about. So we want to get your take. Um, and obviously going from, you know, you had no continuity, like you said, in the NBA. 25 guys playing open gym to having, you know, the continuity you had in, in FS. But how play, – players always get labeled as busts, whether you're the two pick, the 30th pick, whatever. At, right. at what point should organizations get labeled as busts? <laughs> You know what I'm saying for organization for not and baby bust ain't the right word, but what accountability does the organization have when like the Kings for instance? You can only call so many people bust before yeah. you look at the people responsible for the development. Yeah. You know, nah, true. I mean, it's tough. It's a tough thing because there's a lot of different pressures from different angles when you when you at that level to win. You know, you want your picks to work out. Sometimes you don't give them enough time. And then you just, they get labeled in their second year. Ah, guys are bust. Get rid of them. When he probably hasn't even figured it out yet. Some people take, you know, four or five years to figure it out. Some people figure it out week one. So it's just his, like, I think with a lot of these, a lot of these organizations, I think you got to allow, you know, kids, especially like 18 year old kids, dog. Like, <laughs> 18 year old kid by the time they 21 in their third year they ain't averaging 18 and 10 like you expect them to you call them a bust like 
the man's still not even anywhere close to his prime. He got five, six years before he's in his prime. So I think a lot of the times they just give up on kids too early, um, which it's a business, and there's always going to be a new kid coming in the next year because there's always a draft. So, you know, it's tough to find that, that opportunity. But like you said, I mean, these certain organizations have, have you know, been – kind of pits for for guys that have, have been drafted to these locations and you know a lot of times it, it's a lot of roster turnover I don't know Sacramento's had new coaches like every two years they haven't really found a, a face of that franchise who's allowed them to kind of you know use these guys and grow and I know this De'Aaron Fox has, has been there for a few years and I think he's a, a really good player and I know they're trying to put pieces around him now I think this Davion Mitchell's a good guy so hopefully you know they start trending in the right direction but I think the most important thing is is that you you know, I think a lot of teams don't give guys enough time to to kind of grow into their own. And I think, I mean, for me, I've only spent two years consecutively in two different places in my career. In college, I was in University of Miami for two years. And in that second year, I kind of, you know, exploded and became who I was. And then my first year with FS, it was solid. But then the second year is when I exploded, averaged 23 on 55, 50, 90 some shooting. And I think once you find that comfortability and you find, you know, that situation where you're comfortable and you feel like you can be yourself and you kind of being yourself works within what the organization or whatever the club wants to do and what the coach wants to do, that's when you really see guys kind of, you know, turn into what they their best selves are. And I think a lot of the times clubs don't give or clubs, organizations, franchises don't give guys that opportunity or the fit isn't right with the people around them. And I think if more people allowed teams to have time and, and patience to for these guys to grow into who they could, then a lot of these guys wouldn't necessarily be bust or or whatever the case may be. But, I mean, we're sitting here from this side of it, speaking on this side, when we don't have the pressures of the owners and the, all these people in your ear, like, you drafted this dude six in the draft is his third year, he still can't even shoot 40% from three? What the hell y'all doing? So then it's like, all right, well... Let's move him on and let's bring in the next kid and see if he works out magically. So, you know, it's a, it's a, I mean, depending on what side of the, the line you're standing on, it's definitely different. But um, I think time and patience, situation, opportunity are all things that go into, you know, the success of individuals in each and every situation, regardless if you're in Europe or NBA or, or wherever. So it's just, it's just tough, tough. Tough world. Basketball is not it's dirty. It's not dirty for the, game. <laughs> man, it is not for the the faint of heart, boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It should get very real very quickly. Vicious. So, yeah. What you think, Ant? Yeah, nah, it's a, man. Um, I, I think uh, it's it, it's tough to say, man. Every situation is different, especially with the players. I mean, some guys, you know, they get the success, they stop working. Um, you know, it's – and then also, it, it also depends on the culture, you know, the vets that are there, you know. And, yeah. you know, there's a lot of things – there's a lot of things surrounding that situation that it's tough to point the finger directly at the player or point the finger directly at the organization. Um, I think, you know, the solution is the organizations that are drafting these kids just got to do their homework, man. You got to do their homework and make sure that this player that you're drafting fits in with the culture, with the uh, w with the guys in the locker room, and et cetera, et cetera, and even that's hard because then a trade comes across your desk and you got to shuffle some guys around because you right. want to take this risk. So, right. and that changes the culture. So, I don't know. There's just a lot of moving pieces in basketball. It's uh, it's hard to say. Man, I think I think they should change it up. They should let the players start doing their homework. Let them pick their teams, man. What you mean? Why I got why I got to be a eighteen year old? Going to Sacramento when I know y'all are trash and I know you about to set me up for failure, man. That's like that's that's ridiculous. Like back there, should, here, there should be some cities an eighteen year old like, can't go. Man, you like, can't draft them there. Like well, it's, it's crazy. Kind of certain age. I mean, when I, when I was in France, I had you know both years in France, I had Sekou Demboya and then I had Teo Maladon, and it's like these GMs. You know, I mean, Shane know how it is, obviously from from getting uh, and, and you too. But they they come to you and they're like, oh, like you know, what's their strengths? What's their weaknesses? Right. It's like yada. And I'm going to tell you exactly what their strengths and weaknesses is because I just spent the last seven, eight months every day with this kid, kicking it with him, right. playing with him. And it's like, listen, he's not going to be a good fit for your organization. He needs to go here, and this is where he's going to thrive. 
And then they gonna go draft the motherfucker anyway, and then be surprised three years later when he flops. Like, all right, well, fuck me then, I guess. Like, damn. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not that my word is anything like is the holy grail, but it's just like, what you asking for then? Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, I think True. they should they should really start allowing. And I don't know what that would look like. I'm just spitballing, but they should really start allowing these kids to choose their teams themselves. Just let them be free agents. <laughs> <laughs> Come to I mean, technically, if you go undrafted, you is a free agent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but don't nobody want to be in that boat neither. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the time, it's like even better to go second round, bro. Yeah, like the top a lot of the second round. To go second round. Find a better fit. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. you can find a better fit. You control what kind of deal you sign. If you want to do two years, three years, or you could do one year, fully guaranteed next year, team option, playoffs. Like, there's a lot of flexibility in that second round, but. Obviously, getting the guaranteed money in the first round pick is is obviously what you want, and hopefully the situation works out. But you see a lot of guys in the second round that get to you know kind of bounce around early on, and then they find a fit, and then it's like all right. And then he's making, you know, he's making a four year hundred before the guy on the the first round pick is getting out of his first deal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, but like you said, it's all opportunity, dog. It's like if you can hoop, you can hoop, and you gonna find somewhere where you can hoop at, but. A lot of it is opportunity and politics and little bullshit that goes into it that health. you know a lot of people don't see from the outside. Yeah, yeah health. health. A lot of things people don't under understand that really go into this whole whole basketball thing that you know people just see the final product and say, oh, this guy can play, this guy can't play. You see highlights on switch cultures like, oh, this guy should be in the league. Oh, <laughs> this guy shouldn't. Now you know they just it's like it's a lot of surface level shit that people see that don't really understand all the things that's shuffling underneath the table that that go into it but i mean it's part it's part of the business which if you were part of it and you've been in it like y'all have seen it it's, yeah it's more than just can you play yeah a lot yeah. of people could play bro nah, no question so. that's that's kind of yeah, the, the, do, the dope part the dope part about podcast too is you try and bring that stuff to life you know what i'm saying and we switch cultures which y'all got mm-hmm. going on over there so just try and bring those stories out bring them to life so we'll go ahead we got the last yeah. segment yeah yeah, last segment, man, as we wrap up here, paycheck, rain check, somebody's paycheck is taking a rain check. And uh, today's highlight is Jordy Bertumayu, the uh, the CEO of EuroLeague, got his walking papers. And uh, and now EuroLeague is, uh, is, I guess, is on the, is on the search for a successor. Uh, so my question is, should EuroLeague consider a former player to step in as CEO or the commissioner? Um, I guess he'd be the equivalent to the commissioner of the league um, in EuroLeague. I think so. I mean, I think that's the best the best way to get the best product out of, you know, what the EuroLeague is and what it stands for. Obviously, Jordy did a great job of creating a, a product that has gotten to the level where it is now. But I think in order to push the, push the, the league to new heights, I think you should have somebody who's been on this side of it, who's understood the, the little things that happen behind the scenes, all the, the BS that you got to deal with as a player, the things that you wish, sitting here as a player right now today, I wish this would happen or I wish that could happen. And if I had a position of power, maybe I could push that upon the owners and say different things or give different ideas or put different things on the table that they may you know, take a hit at. Um, so I think so. I think somebody like Tony Parker, even though he's an owner in Asheville, I think he has a lot of good ideas that I know I've had, you know, through through people I've had conversations with him that he has ideas for what he thinks the yearly can be and how he wants to take it to you know, more of that NBA concept. Um, and it just depends on like, you know, Pau Gasol is obviously over here. He obviously has a lot of experience in both both uh, both continents, NBA, Eurobasket, all those things. So. I definitely think somebody that is has played and, and understands what it takes to be a player. And now, you know, he's had success being, you know, I don't know what's his exact role. Uh, does he is he the owner of Asheville now or Tony, yeah, yeah. Is he the president? President, president owner. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, so I think he, you know, he understands kind of both sides of the spectrum. So to be able to put him in a position where, you know, I don't know if he could still own or be the president of Asheville and take on that position, but I think the ideas that he is he has had and the things that I've heard that he wants to do, he would be somebody that uh, could definitely be you know influential in, in pushing this this league to new heights. Man, uh, the year the year I spent, I, I agree. With Tony would be Tony be a great candidate. Uh, the year I spent in Asheville, man, he, just the way things were run was super. 
yeah. super forward. Like it was like just the little things, you know what I'm saying? Like I think my mom had uh, had cancer that year, so he allowed me to stay home in preseason for three months. You know what I'm saying? He right. coming to the, just you know right. and, that, and that overseas that that stuff matters. You know what I'm saying? That stuff matters a lot. Right. You know we had a coach, right. Montenegrin coach. He wasn't rolling. Like he was like, nah, you going for a week. And Tony was like, nah, you're right. good. You know what I'm saying? So. Um, right. Yeah, I think. I mean, I don't. I don't know if it needs to be a player. If it's a player, they need to really just hire me because I'm gonna have that shit together. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying I got plenty of ideas too. You know what I'm saying? Former player, but nah. Um, right. I, it, it doesn't. It, if I don't think it needs to be a player, I think it would be dope. Um, I think as long as it's someone who's kind of a creative and forward thinking person um, in t- from right. from business entertainment side, because I think the only way. Um, right. it, it, I struggle with this topic because I think the only way to grow basketball is to make it entertainment. But when you make it entertainment, you do, you lose some of that purity of the game, right? You know what I'm saying? Right. And I don't know if y'all watched right. Winning Time and all that, but for the NBA, it was you look at the past and basketball culture kind of does move west to east. And, it, you know, with right. Jerry Buss and, and David Stern and all these people come in and kind of changing the, the culture of the NBA. So I think whoever it is has to has to be – Something along those lines, you know, to make the game entertaining, make the make Euroleague kind of a fanfare thing. But then at the same right. time, are European fans ready for that? Because European fans really do love right. the period of game, period of the game. Correct. So correct. It's that's a fine line. It's a fine line, man. And like you said, that's what people Very is cool. is you know fa- fans, people looking at the, from the outside in. I mean, there's stuff we don't even understand, right? So for for people. Right. You know, looking in, they definitely don't get it. So, yeah, it's a fact. That's definitely a fact, man. I think uh, I don't know. I think TP sounds like a like a good candidate. I think somebody that has the experience of the NBA and Euroleague or European basketball in general, I think, will be best because the NBA has done a phenomenal job in growing that league and increasing yeah. increasing increasing the market value. You know what I mean? You good? <laughs> Don't look at me. Wisconsin. <laughs> Are you good? Wisconsin. <laughs> Wisconsin. Don't look at me like that. All right. Don't look at me like hey, that. Hey, this this the right, last so. episode. Before you finish, we gonna stop bringing up this Minnesota Wisconsin stuff. You you went to Stanford. <laughs> Huh? You, you had more white kids on the team than we, we did. We was blacker than y'all. We was blacker than y'all. That ain't an accomplishment. <laughs> I, I'm, just letting you know, I'm just letting you know. Until it was four, until it, I was, see, it was three to two and a half. Right, till I see the till I see the back row of that crayon box <laughs> on y'all roster, I don't want to hear nothing from Wisconsin. All right. What shade? What shade? What shade? Kind is you? Kind of you whole or you had? Yeah, well. No, you said what? Well? Uh, you had. Gotta be. Yeah. All right. Finish, finish, yo. Finish, yo. Uh, <laughs> nah, but I'm just saying, like, the NBA's done a great job, you know, as far as marketing the league, creating a, you know, a bunch of revenue, you know, for the league, for the teams, for the players. And I think that that's, that's kind of what, you know, Europe needs or Euro League needs, you know, to become, you know, uh, a global power. You know what I mean? And they, they have the talent, they have the history, they got the tradition. I think it's just all on the marketing side in, in, in Euro League. So, whether it's uh, somebody that's, uh, like you said, somebody that's just a creative and, and forward thinking um, or just a player that has seen, you know, both sides. I think something, something's got to change. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt, man. That's, uh, I mean, shoot, that just goes back. First thing, first thing I would do is definitely break them domestic leagues off from, from the Euro League. <laughs> <laughs> So that would be the first, first – I mean, domestic league can stay, but that would be the first order of business, man. Definitely be the first order of business. Yeah, all right. You be at that press conference. Get your hand out my pocket. That'd be over. Yeah. Like, man, they show it fucked up when they did a little old Jordan, man. But they, but they going to remember me, though. I'll tell you that much. That's my legacy. If that's yeah. my legacy, that's they my gonna, legacy. Uh, I'm over You're going to be the first commissioner up. to get stoned on EuroLeague TV. <laughs> yeah, but, but 50 <laughs> years from now, they're going to be like, damn, Jordan Taylor, when they break off finally, they'll be like, you know who started this shit? <laughs> Jordan Taylor from Wisconsin. Hey, they can do the deal. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, man, but listen, Shane, we appreciate you greatly for coming on, man. I enjoyed the conversation. 
Uh, it's beautiful to have a, a legend such as yourself on our platform, and uh, good luck with the with the domestic league playoffs, and uh, <laughs> you know, and continued success to you, man, and and appreciate you. Yeah, I appreciate y'all having me on, bro.